You may be seated. Who could forget the seagulls in Finding Nemo? I mean, they're a classic, aren't they? What do they say? Mine, 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 mine. It kind of became a mantra around our house. Anytime somebody would say, yeah, that's mine, we'd say, mine, 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 mine. It's also kind of the mantra of the world, isn't it? I mean, people just live by that. That's mine. Hey, that's mine. This is mine. It's my job. It's my house. It's my car. These are my kids. It's mine. All it's mine. But when you have a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ, something changes. And what changes is your attitude about what is mine. It moves from being mine to being his and then to being yours. You heard Pastor Chad say it just a few moments ago, the the mission of Calvary Church is Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ by the love of his people and the power of his truth. So Calvary is all about this life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And as that changes, it transforms every part of our life, even how we look at money and how we look at possessions, and how we look at everything that we would think is mine. Today we're going to look at a parable that Jesus told called the parable of the minas. Kind of an interesting play on words, isn't it? Mine, minas. It's in Luke chapter 19, and if you're using one of the Bibles in the seat in front of you, it's on page 1044, 1044. It's a wonderful story, but it really illustrates The difference that's made when a person has a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ, the transformation, and what illustrates that. So I'm going to share with you three words today that are signs of a transformed life, especially when it comes to what we own and what we have. So Luke chapter 19, we're going to start in verse 11. So if you're on page 1044, it's in that first column, and it says the parable of the ten minas. Here's what it says. As they heard these things, he, that is Jesus, proceeded to tell a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him. And sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over ten cities." And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, You are to be over five cities. And then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you're a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. This parable is powerful, and it really illustrates the transformation that takes place when you have a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ, and it begins in that very first verse. The first word that I want to share with you today is the word surrender. Surrender. Because in that first verse, notice what it says. It says, as they heard these things, What things is he talking about? It always makes me curious to to look at a verse and say, okay, as they heard these things, what was happening that led up to Jesus telling this parable? Well, what led up to it is what happens in the first part of Luke chapter 19, which is the story of Zacchaeus. Now, you remember the story of Zacchaeus. 
You probably have heard about it as, as uh, there's been sermons about it. We love the story of Zacchaeus. As children, we learned that little song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. It wasn't just a wee little man. Zacchaeus was a wicked little man. He was a tax collector, and he collected pretty much all that he wanted. And tax collectors were known to be pretty dishonest, and so they ended up being pretty wealthy. And this was a wealthy, wicked man. But there was something about Jesus that just drew him in. He wanted to know more about him. He wanted to hear what he had to say. He had heard that this man hung out with tax collectors and sinners, and that was not normal. And so when Jesus was coming through his hometown of Jericho, he climbed up in a tree because he was a short guy, and he wanted to see Jesus. But it wasn't just that he saw Jesus. Jesus saw him. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus was like, me? My house? Jesus came to his house, and the experience he had with Jesus was so life-changing, so transforming, that it changed everything about him, and he was willing to surrender everything he had. Now, if you look in that same page I had you on earlier, just look up at the top of that column in verse 8. It has a little 8 by it. It says, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus had such a life-changing experience, it, it changed the way he looked at what was so important to him, his money. Now you contrast this story with a story that happened in the previous chapter, a story about a man that we've come to call the rich young ruler. This man came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I've, I've kept all the commandments from the time I was a little boy. What more should I do to have e eternal life? And Jesus said, go, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Now, Jesus wasn't trying to give a, a rule for everyone to follow. Jesus saw into that man's heart, and he saw what was really the most important thing to him. It was, it was his God. It was, it was everything to him. And Jesus said, in order for you to really have eternal life, you've got to give that up. You've got to come follow me. And it said that the man went away sad because he had great possessions. Well, the reason he went away sad wasn't because he had great possessions, but because he wasn't willing to give them up. Zacchaeus is like the, the total opposite. When he meets Jesus, he is so overjoyed, his life is so changed, he is so transformed, he does what Jesus asked the rich young ruler to do voluntarily. Here's what he says, Lord, I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor, and I'm going to give I'm going to give back everything I've taken fourfold. Now you think, wait a minute, Jesus told the rich young ruler to give everything to the poor. But by the time Zacchaeus gives half of what he has to the poor and pays back everything he takes four times, he's broke. Guarantee it. He has nothing left. But it didn't mean anything to him. Because Jesus had so changed his life that he was willing to surrender it all. It was just it was everything he could do. His life had been so transformed by Jesus that it went from his to yours, from mine to his. No longer did he regard his possessions as his own. He gave them freely. Now that kind of transformation is what takes place when a person has an experience with Jesus. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. I've seen it happen in my own family. Now some of you know the story of our son, Jeremiah, who went away as a missionary to Africa when he was 21 to reach an unreached people group in Africa and was killed coming back from a remote village. That, that surrender, that sacrifice that he made didn't start there. It started a year earlier. And Jeremiah grew up in our house. He grew up as a pastor's kid and he was you know, it was always kind of in and out with his, uh, his spiritual life, and he would rebel at times, he would come back at times, sometimes he would walk with the Lord, sometimes he would do anything but walk with the Lord. And when he was about 20, he came home and said, I'm going to go on a mission trip to Africa. 
So we thought that was a little unusual, but we supported him in that, and he went on this mission trip. He came back. He said, Mom and Dad, I've got to go back to Africa. That's where Jesus wants me. I, I know, and God had done a, an incredible, life-changing experience with him in Africa. He surrendered everything. He was uh, going to go over and be a missionary, and that's, uh, that, that's how he wanted to, to give his life. He gave up his uh, semester in college, and he was, he was ready to do that. So when he gave his life on the mission field, it was something that he had already done in his heart. He'd already surrendered it all. Now this, this was really a big deal. I mean, the transformation was huge. We have two daughters. My youngest daughter has two children. She has one baby on the way. We're pretty excited about that. She was in a doctor's office recently, about a month ago. And she's in the waiting room. And there's another girl in the waiting room. And she looked at my daughter and she said, uh, you have a brother, don't you? A brother named Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah's been gone for about six years. So it, it was really unusual. My daughter said, yeah, I have a brother named Jeremiah. She said, I went to school with Jeremiah. What's he doing now? My daughter said, well, he went to Africa as a missionary and he was killed. The girl said, get out of town. <laughs> she couldn't believe that he, she said, are we talking about the same Jeremiah I went to school with? She couldn't believe it. It was, it was such a huge transformation. She couldn't really take in and understand why he would surrender everything. But that's what happens when you have a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. And it, it's, it's not just money. I mean, when Jesus Christ comes into your life, it changes you. I've, I've seen people give up alcohol, drugs, pornography, sex, immoral life, status, power, position, because what once was your God, what was so important to you, now just doesn't mean that much because Jesus Christ has changed your life. You surrender. That's really where it begins. This, this, whole, this whole word, the words that we're talking about, signs of a transformed life, it begins with that word surrender. And that begins with a life-changing experience with Christ. Well, after Jesus had that experience with Zacchaeus and they all saw that happen, then he began to tell this parable. And the parable was about a nobleman who goes to a far country to receive a kingdom for himself. Does that sound familiar? It should. It's the story of Jesus. And he calls ten of his servants and he gives them ten minas, one mina apiece. Now, uh, not that it's, it's really the most important thing, but a mina was worth about three months' wages, about a, a quarter of a year. So someone's going to give you a quarter of your year's salary, and, and they're going to go away, and they're going to say, I want you to do business with this until I return, and here's your, your assignment. I want you to do something with this that is going to advance my kingdom, or going to advance my cause, that's going to enlarge or expand my territory. Any of those things, use, use whatever metaphor you want They're to, to do business, not for themselves, but for the nobleman, for the master. Okay. At the same time, you've got this other group, this other group in the parable, his citizens. In verse 14, it says, But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. So you have the servants... Who are, who are willing then to, to submit to the master and go and do what he wants them to do. And then you have these citizens that say, we don't want this man to reign over us. The second word that I want you to write down is the word submit. Submit. Because the servants were willing to submit to the master to do what he wanted. Not because he forced them to, not because he made them, but because they wanted to. They wanted to submit because he is the master. Then you have this other group. And the other group says, we don't man want this man to reign over us. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. We don't want to do what he wants to do. We want to do what we want to do. They're kind of like the, the two-year-old that says, you're not the boss of me. How many of you have ever heard a two-year-old say that? Well, this is a reflection of the human heart. I mean, this is, this is really what's inside of us. We don't want anyone telling us what to do. We want to do what we want to do. I mean, if you look at our, our, our culture, look, look around us, all we are is grown-up two-year-olds saying, you're not the boss of me. 
The difference is when a person has a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ, one of the signs of that trans- transformation is they're willing to submit their lives to him. They're willing to say, I want to serve him. I want to do what he wants me to do and not what, what I want to do. Now, next Monday, we're going to have a holiday. You guys are going to have some fun next weekend uh, with this. It's not my favorite holiday, but it's, it's Halloween. The most important thing that ever happened on Halloween was not kids getting candy or a, a haunted house or, or even a block party. Our church does a big block party to reach out to our neighborhood. None of those things. The most important thing that ever happened at Halloween was a very obscure and seemingly insignificant act that took place 499 years ago this year, almost 500 years ago. A relatively obscure monk by the name of Martin Luther went to a small church in a place called Wittenberg, Germany, and he nailed on the door of that church 95 grievances against the Roman Catholic Church. And in that act, he began a movement called the Protestant Reformation. And while many don't, many discount what that really meant, it changed the course of history. It changed the world as we know it. One of the big ideas that came out of the Protestant Reformation was this, that the chief end or the chief purpose of a person's life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It actually made its way into one of the confessions. The chief aim or chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And that idea began to make its way into the lives of people. And they began to think about things differently, especially like their work. So work was was always something tedious, something that you had to do, something you worked for somebody else so you could make a living enough to eke out a living for your family. But this idea that the chief purpose of your life is to glorify God changed the way people felt about work. So now they started looking at work as like, we want to do the best we can because we want to glorify God. We want to work hard because we want to glorify God. We want to, we want to apply ourselves in every way we can because we want to glorify God. We want to, we want to invent things. We want to make things. We want to do things. We want to do things that will glorify God. And that began to change Western civilization. And when you look around today, you see the difference between Western civilization and the way the rest of the world lives. A lot of that has to do with this idea, the Protestant work ethic. We want to glorify God in what we do. But here's what's happened. And the the idea behind that was the reason we want to glorify God in all that we do is because we want to worship Him, do things as an act of worship. But what what happens when you do that? When you apply excellence and you work hard and you work like you're working for the Lord, you want to glorify Him, you typically, you advance, you prosper, you gain, you, you multiply. That's what happens. And the idea was By doing that, then you'll have more to share, more to give. You'll be able to glorify God. You'll be able to do more for Him. But as we've moved further away from that idea, now the idea is, yeah, we want to work hard. We want to to get more. We want to gain and we want to advance so that we'll have more and we'll have bigger houses and more things, more possessions and more things that we can call our own so that we can enjoy life forever. There's a big difference. Those are two very different ideas about how to live life. Either to glorify God, do all that we can to bring glory to Him so we can enjoy Him forever, or we do all that we can to get all the possessions and all the material goods that we can so we can, we can have more than everybody else, and then we can try to enjoy life forever. And people don't realize they're not going to enjoy life forever. Two completely different philosophies of life, and it begins with this word, Submit. Because when we submit our lives to Him and we say we want to serve Him, it means that we want everything we do to bring glory and honor to Him. And as He blesses us and as we are able to, to, uh, to gain more, that gives us more opportunity to give and share and serve and, and do good because we want to glorify God. Versus the idea that I want to get all I can, have all I can, have more than everybody else, because then I'm really going to enjoy life. The sign of a transformed life is submitting to God. Which category are you in? Where are you at today? It starts with surrender. Second word, submit. The third word, serve. Serve. Look back at the parable in Luke chapter 19 and look down to verse 16. The first servant 
came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you've been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Now, we're never told what they did to make more, and we're not even told how it was measured. Was this, was this more crops? Was it more land? Was, what, what kind of wealth was this? All we know is that they took what they were given, they served so that they could prosper the master, and they had, as they came back, they had more to give to him than what they were given. The reward for that was they were given more influence and greater opportunities to serve the master. That's interesting to me. The reward was not something that was going to benefit them, but they were going to be able to serve in a greater way, have greater influence, be able to do even more than they had done before because that's what they were doing. They were serving the master. They were advancing his kingdom. They were extending his influence. They were, they were helping him to become more well-known. All of that for the master because they were serving him and not themselves. It's really a big issue whether we're serving ourselves or whether we're serving the master. And the, the truth is, the same thing can be true for a church. What is true of individuals can also be true of churches. And I see this a lot because I preach in a lot of churches. I see churches that, that are pretty much concerned with themselves. They're, they're inward in their focus. They, they try to do everything they can to preserve what they have and survive. And that's their focus. I'm so thankful that Calvary is not a church like that. This is a church that is focused outwardly to the community and to the world. You give your people, you give your resources, you give your money. You are blessing people not only here in Lake Havasu, but also in Arizona and around the world. In fact, I got a letter just this past week from John Dinah, our missionary in Africa. And he sent me this letter so that I could read it to you this morning. Here's what he said. This is the missionary that, that Pastor Chad and I stayed with. We were in, in Mozambique. Dear Calvary Baptist, I wanted to send a note with Pastor David Johnson to express our thanks for your generous support of God's work in Mozambique. First, you shared Pastor Chad with us to be a part of a team that did a wonderful job of teaching God's word on stewardship. Chad was a delight to have in Mozambique and blessed all that he shared with. I did learn that Chad was not shy. Hmm. Wow, that didn't take long. And loves ice cream, in case you didn't already know that. While Pastor Chad was here, we were able to visit a site where Calvary would sponsor a freshwater well to be used by over 1,000 people. This has now been completed, and we continue to share the gospel in that location. Those are the people in that village. I don't know if you know this or not, but when you put a well in a village in Africa, you change the life of that village. Chad and I were at this place. We saw the place where they were pulling water out of the ground. It was a hole. The water was filthy. It's full of disease and bacteria. And the end result of that, no matter how much you boil it, is going to be cholera and dysentery and typhoid, waterborne diseases which raises infant mortality, which means the children in that picture did not have much of a chance. But now they do. You've changed the life of a village, a thousand people in Africa. You've created an opportunity for them to reach adulthood, to be able to create a better life. And even more than that, you are now giving them the opportunity to hear the message of the living water of Jesus Christ. The gospel, because everywhere we place a well, we plant a church. The letter goes on. During Chad's visit, he informed us that you would be helping with more wells, and we are working on that project right now. I have just received notice that you also generously have given $2,000 for IMB missionaries to buy Bibles in Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia, and Angola. Your ongoing support through the cooperative program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering keeps us on the field and supplies needs such as vehicles, diesel fuel, place to live, and funds to do ministry. Dear church, 
please accept my sincere thanks for such sacrificial and relevant gifts that will bless so many that most of you will never meet with both physical help and eternal hope in our Lord Jesus. Pastor Chad taught about generosity while he was here, and you have modeled that in multiple and important ways. In the name of so many in these countries, please receive my heartfelt thanks for these acts of selfless giving to the glory of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Calvary. Thank you. That is what you're doing. You're serving. But what you do as a church also has to be applied to you as a person. Now, some of you have noticed this parable is very much like another parable that Jesus told, the parable of the talents. In the parable of the talents, Jesus told, there was one servant that was given five talents, one that was given two, and one that was given one. The ending is very much the same, and the lesson is the same in both parables. But when, when we read the parable of the talents, sometimes we think, well, you know, I'm not really a five-talent person. Maybe I'm a two-talent person. Oh, maybe, maybe I'm just a one-talent person. Well, if you feel like that, then the parable of the minas is your parable. Because in this parable, all the servants were given the same amount. The same resource, the same amount of time, the same responsibility. And the lesson is this. What will you do with what you've been given? Every person in this room has been given something from God. You've been given resources. You've been given a, a body, a mind. You've been given time, energy, ability. And every one of us in this room will be accountable to God for what we do with what we've been given. There's a scene from a movie that haunts me. The movie is called Schindler's List. If you remember the movie, it's a, it's a true story about a man named Oskar Schindler, who was a German businessman who, during World War II, bought Jewish prisoners out of concentration camps so they could work in his factory. He wasn't trying to rescue them. He was trying to make money because it was cheap labor. But he ended up saving hundreds of lives. But this scene at the end of that movie stays with me to this day. I think of it often. I want to share it with you. I don't want to stand before my master someday and say, I could have done more. So much money, so much time, wasted. I could have gotten one more well, one more Bible, one more missionary, one more person, one more person. Hear the message of Jesus Christ. I don't want to stand before my master and say that. And the only way to keep that from happening is if we surrender, we submit, we serve. From mine to his to yours.